Hello and welcome. Praise the Lord. What a beautiful day. We're so glad that you chose to come and worship with us today. Um, they must have some really good stuff over in the fellowship hall. <laughs> we have a few seats here to fill in, but we're so glad to see you this morning. And we're here to sing praises to our Lord and then hear from his word this morning. And so would you stand with us and lift your voices with us? What an awesome Savior we serve. Your love, oh Lord, it reaches to the heavens. Your love, oh Lord, reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness stretches to the sky. Your righteousness is like a mighty mountain. Justice flows like the ocean's tide, and I will lift my heart to worship you, my King. I will find my heart strength in the shadow of your wings. Your love.
Praise the Lord. Everlasting God, you do 
Oh, we praise you, Lord. Lord, your word in Romans, Paul asks us to offer ourselves as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God. This is a spiritual form of worship. And so our bodies are meant for the Lord and the Lord for our bodies. And this song is an offering. And Lord, we pray that you would be pleased with it.
pride is weighing me down it's choking my heart i'm chained up and bound well if pride is my prison then grace be my key a sweet holy spirit come rescue me spirit spirit i surrender I submit to you now Spirit, Spirit, I surrender Spirit, sweet Holy Spirit
Dear sweet spirit, Lord, we surrender to you today and we offer ourselves as a sacrifice. Lord, please have your way in us and through us. Lord, there's no better thing that we can do with our lives than to offer them to you because you're the only one that showed us the grace and mercy to send your son that we may be reconciled through you. And so, Lord, help us to be more like Jesus and to love one another and to carry one another's burdens. For none of us is perfect. There was only one perfect one, and he sacrificed for us. And it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. So I've got this friend, I'll call him John. John's first exposure to the whole concept of hell was when he was watching a Tom and Jerry cartoon when he was younger. And what was intended to be this humorous cartoon all of a sudden turned into this hellacious nightmare when Tom did something bad to Jerry and was thrown into hell as a result. And later, John was at his church and he was talking with an older man about what he'd seen. And the older man looked at John and said, John, you don't want to go to hell, do you? John said, no. So the man looked back at him and said, okay, pray this prayer after me. Dear Jesus, John kind of paused. There's some awkward silence, and then he realized he was supposed to say exactly what the man had said. So he said, dear Jesus, and the man continued, I know that I'm a sinner, and I believe that Jesus died for my sins, and I ask you to come into my heart and save me. And then when they were finished, the man looked at John and said, Son, now you can know that you are saved from your sins and you don't ever have to worry about hell again. Is that true? Is this really what it means to become a disciple of Jesus? Is this really what it means to follow him? You look back at the first disciples in the Bible and when Jesus came up to them and said, follow me, that was not an invitation to pray a prayer. That was a summons for these men to lose their lives. But somewhere along the way, 2,000 years later, amid varying cultural tides and popular church trends, we have virtually missed that call. With good intentions, with sincere desires to reach as many people as possible for Jesus, we've taken challenging words from Christ and turned them into trite phrases in the church. And in the process, we've drained the lifeblood out of Christianity and replaced it with a watered-down version of the gospel that is so palatable, it's not even real anymore. And the consequences are catastrophic. Scores of men, women, and children culturally identify themselves as Christians today who biblically are not followers of Christ. Is that possible? Absolutely it is. In fact, according to Jesus, it's probable. He said at the end of his most famous sermon, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? And I will tell them, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Those are some of the most frightening words in all of the Bible. As a pastor, I stay awake some nights haunted by the thought that many people, many people were sitting in church on Sunday will be shocked to stand before Jesus one day and hear him say to them, I never knew you, away from me. We desperately need to take a look at our lives and our churches and ask the question, are we really biblically, personally following Jesus? Eternity is dependent on how we answer that question. I want to welcome everyone and uh, especially our first time guest and uh, our returning guest as well. Now, have you ever considered that many of us may not be abundantly enjoying life the way that God has created us to enjoy Him 
and to enjoy the world around us, maybe, just maybe, because we are abusing and violating our own bodies in such a way that it is making us unhealthy. I mean, think about that for a moment. I mean, think about how important it is that, that, that you and I, that the most healthier and fit bodies that we have, the more you and I will be available to be used by God, body, mind, and spirit. Because, see, this is what we need to understand. That all of these, the, our body, mind, and spirit are all connected, and they affect each other. Well, what do you mean by that, Eddie? Well, if I am emotionally exhausted, worn out, and depressed, it affects me physically, which then affects me spiritually. Or if I am physically sick and unhealthy and my, my body's, my knees and my back and whatever, you know, everything's hurting, then it affects me emotionally, doesn't it? And mentally, which then affects me spiritually. And so these are all connected. And we need to be able to understand that God is looking to bring healing and hope and grace and mercy on the whole being, not just on one particular part. Does that make sense? Now, before we go any further and address that with the truth of the Scriptures, let's pause and pray because we're going to ask God to give us a tremendous amount of grace as we're going to talk about some difficult issues in our culture and society and uh, primarily in our life. So let's bow our heads and pray. Father, I thank you, Lord, that um, you are a God of mercy and grace. And, Lord, that you have given us the ultimate solution to all our hurts, our habits, and our hang-ups. And all we can do is come to you with them because we're not able, Lord, in our own strength to overcome. But, Father, we need to see that, that our physical health is an important part of making our life count for you and clogging our arteries and letting our heart and our mind and our spirit, Lord, to become unhealthy actually hinders our joy and our destiny in you. And so, Father, we gather here and we ask you, Lord, give us the wisdom and the power today to do your will on earth as it is in heaven and not our own will that is leading us to sickness and death. And so we ask all these things, Lord, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Uh, if you wouldn't mind uh, taking out your Bibles and turning with me to, uh, in the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 43, and as well as the verses will be on the screen. Isaiah uh, chapter 43 says, I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Now we go, why? Everyone who is called by my name, who I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. And right here in the Old Testament, I, I, I always like starting in the Old Testament and kind of moving into the New Testament because I want you to see how in the Bible, from the Old to the New, that it's all intertwined and that there's these themes that go throughout and we get a deeper revelation as we continue to kind of read and study the Word of God. And it's so important that we do. But many of us, we say, okay, God has created us and formed us and, and that leaves us with the implication that that you and I have a purpose and a destiny, that there is something here of greater worth and value that you and I are to live for. And that maybe, just maybe, the mundane life that you and I may be experiencing could be that maybe we have accepted living for trifles instead of living for the abundance of God's life that he has for you and for me, for all of us. Now, what I want us to appreciate here, especially in the Old Testament, is that not only in Jesus' time, but also in ancient times, even before Jesus, in the Old Testament, 
you, you had what we called Gnostics. And you're going to see Gnostics from going back 5,000 years, and there's Gnostics today. And Gnostics are, uh, when, when Jesus was, was sharing and, and talking, basically speaking to a crowd of people who basically believe that, hey, you know what? This physical world doesn't matter. Our bodies don't matter. Just live life for whatever you can do. Get as much as you can, as fast as you can. Don't worry about it. And uh, many of us might have a co-worker or, or family member that we know that kind of believes that, don't we? And then you have, then you have the flip side of that pendulum uh, of people throughout all of human history uh, is what we're going to see is narcissistic people. Uh, narcissistic people are those who basically, well, you know what? The world is, all, everything in life is about me, me, myself, and I. I'm the sun. And everybody revolves around me to make me happy, right? And you, and you, have, you have these two ends. And, and Jesus speaking into a, into a culture and saying, listen, okay, life is so much greater than me, myself, and I, that, that, that we would be selling ourselves short by living for self and accepting trifles in our life instead of the abundant joy and blessing that God would have for us. And if we're Gnostic, in which I, well, I'm going to get as much as I can, as fast as I can, then we're also missing out on the abundance of God because God has created and blessed you in such a way that you put all your hopes and dreams in this life, and the reality is that this life was never meant to satisfy you. This is why many of us are angry. This is why many of us are bitter. This is why many of us are feeling this ache inside and saying, is this it? We're working a job, we're, we're in a career, we're in a relationship, we, we're, 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 we're in a certain country, in a certain family, in a certain city, and we're saying, is, is there nothing more? And there's this natural sense of something missing. And we try to then self-medicate on a whole bunch of other things to try to fill that hole, don't we? And that's why just, this life was not meant to fully satisfy you and me. And so, okay, so if there is, God created us and molded us, then, then really, then, so what is it that he's asking? Well, let's, uh, let's go a little further with that. And if you wouldn't mind now jumping to the New Testament as Paul begins to kind of give us a little piece of what that begins to look like. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So what I want to do is I want to suggest to you that maybe, just maybe, there is something in this life that you and I were created for that is to give us pure joy and pure satisfaction. And maybe we're settling for trifles instead of settling for the best thing in our life. And here, from Isaiah to Romans, we see that God is basically saying, this is the offering that I have given you so that you would be able to experience great joy and great personal satisfaction. Not only in God, but in your relationships, in your finances, in the world around you. And maybe, just maybe, we're just settling for something less. And if that would be true, which I believe it is, and don't believe me because I say so, but read the book yourself and see if you don't come to the same conclusion, that maybe we're not offering God, we're not making the right offering on the altar. And I would suggest to say that maybe that's you and me. Maybe we're trying to give God something else when he's saying, no, you're the most valuable thing. I'm not coming here for trifles. I'm coming here for the ultimate aspect of what God has created, you. You are of such value and so loved. And maybe, just maybe, we've chosen something else. 
Let's go a little further. 1 Corinthians. And here I think it becomes absolutely clear. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. It says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. All right. Whether you're an agnostic and believe, hey, physical world doesn't matter, do whatever you can, God is clearly, clearly, clearly saying in his word that, no, the world matters, your bodies matter, you matter. You're of such importance. Don't sell yourself short. Don't give yourself away for trifles. When I have offered you a kingdom, and I have offered you glory and majesty and power. I have made you sons and daughters of the king with a great inheritance. And it's so important that whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. Because that is where you and I will discover our greatest joy, our greatest personal satisfaction, our greatest success. And when we tend to move away from that is when we begin to experience pain and grief and rejection and all kinds of stuff. And, and all of a sudden we're angry and we're bitter because we're saying, is that what life is all about? And maybe it's just because we just got off a little bit. And I tell you this, not from a theological point of view, it's because your pastor here today is guilty. I'm guilty of getting off the track and trying to do my own thing and trying to say, well, maybe you know, this will be good and this whatever, and I'm, we're, we're going to get into that as I bear my soul and confess my sins. But I, I, I say that only because I'm not coming to a place of trying to bring shame or guilt. I'm, in no, I'm nobody to do that. Because I'm as guilty, if not more guilty. But from a dad's heart, who says that my heart and my passion is that you would not have to go through those terrible pitfalls that I went through. That maybe, just maybe, if I could help some of you, if not all of you, what greater joy could that be for me? And my heart and my passion is to come alongside you, not to judge you or criticize you in any shape or form. Does that make sense? All right. Let's, let's um, turn with me now to 1 Corinthians. And I believe here Paul lay out the, these four things about offering li as a living sacrifice. Because many of us, I think this is where we get stuck in our spiritual journey with God. We hear a whole bunch of rituals and ceremonies and traditions and, 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 and we're jumping through hoops and we're trying to do all kinds of other things. And I believe that this is where we start foundationally. This is where you and I need to be. Because this is what I know. I want to just kind of give a little background here. Every year, every year, hundreds of thousands of Americans die from health problems, brought on by the belief that our bodies can be used solely for gratifying ourselves instead of the living God. I mean, we are actually in a spiritual crisis that has led to a health crisis in our generation. I mean, and despite, despite the cutting edge medical breakthroughs, we are literally killing ourselves with stress related heart attacks, strokes, diabetes, um, high blood pressure, and the probably biggest one of them all, the deadliest one of all, is our addictions and compulsive behaviors. In other words, you and I are enslaved and in bondage to the lusts of our flesh, food, and fornication. And God considers these things spiritual issues that you and I need to fight the good fight of faith against anything that would make us unhealthy by the power of the Holy Spirit. See, you and I are incapable of doing this on our own. You and I need a power from heaven that has come to give us the victory, to give us the power, to be able to say no to the lust of our flesh, 
and food and fornication. We can't do it on our own. And I, and for this reason, and many, many more is why I'm continuing with this teaching series here today called Redemption, which is about knowing and discovering who we are, who God is, and how God brings transformation and renewal to all of creation because the resurrection radically changes everything. It's a whole new ball game now in life. And a matter of fact, that's a blessing for you and for me because under the old system, we were stuck. And under the mercy and the grace and the new covenant, God has provided victory for you and for me. It's an amazing thing. And so as we continue to explore and examine today's scriptures, let's, let's look at Jesus' redemption that redeems my body and your body so that we can finally, finally, abundantly enjoy the supremacy of God in all of life. Because maybe, just maybe, there are some of us, if not many of us, who are just existing in life. But we're not truly abundantly enjoying and experiencing God and the way that he desires a loving father would want any of his children. I mean, how many of us would want to see our children sick and struggling and hurting every day? Wouldn't any parent want this? No, I, I want you to prosper. I want you to experience life. I want you to enjoy the good things, son. My daughter, I want you to experience that. Please don't choose stuff that's going to hurt you. And I believe this is best understood when we begin to consider how our bodies matter to God because they are the temple of the Holy Spirit and are to be used as an instrument of worship to our God. And not merely for the temporary things of self-gratification that is literally killing us before our time. And I, what you and I both could probably attest to, and we could have a thousand testimonies up here, is that you and I can no longer afford to separate the spiritual from secular, faith from fitness, belief from our bodies. Why? Because our God is the God of all things. And when he's brought a redemption, he has brought a full Redemption, complete redemption, not just a part. Because only a complete redemption would work. If he missed one thing, it would never be enough. And we're going to talk a little bit about that as we kind of go along. So how is this all possible? First and foremost, by believing God's promises of self-denial for a greater joy. And here, throughout the Old Testament and New Testament, what you and I are going to see, that maybe, just maybe, we are choosing and accepting trifles in life instead of pursuing the greater joy and the greater blessing and the greater destiny in our life. And the principle that you and I are going to see that and how we can go for the greater joy, and we're going to call that self-denial. All right? Now, okay, let's, uh, 1 Corinthians. What are we offering? <clears throat> uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12, it says, everything is, everything is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. And I, b before we go any further, this is the issue in this text. What will you and I be mastered by? What will you and I let our lives be built on, surrounded by? And maybe, just maybe, there are certain things in our lives that are mastering us, that it's making us unhealthy. And Paul is saying, yeah, it's permissible. 
but do not be mastered by anything. In other words, that this life was never meant to fully satisfy you. That you and I are to get our ultimate joy and our ultimate personal satisfaction in God alone. You and I were created for heavenly things, not temporary things. All right, let's continue. Verse 13. For the stomach and the stomach for food, but God will destroy them both. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in the body? For it is said, the two will become one flesh. But he who unites himself with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Flee. That's the word. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a man commits outside his body. But he who sins sexually sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you whom you have received from God, you are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. All right. Four aspects of you and I understanding what God has called us to offer as an offering to God. Matter of fact, what I, I would love to suggest to you and that you're going to see throughout all the scripture is that you and I were created to worship Worship. And this aspect of worship means what to them do we offer? What do we offer in worship? And let me just say that we have a wonderful worship team who comes and, and every week they provide a wonderful opportunity. But all they're doing is reminding us of the character and the beauty of God and what he's done for you and for me. You and I need to go to him and he's going to lead us into his presence. God's presence, God's power, God's glory. What we do here on the weekends is to remind ourselves of why we're here and that you and I were created for something greater than maybe what we're experiencing. And that is my heart for all of us here and for my own family as well and my sons who are now grown men, that they would experience God and not choose little trifles in this life that they think is going to give them satisfaction but only leave them hurt and wounded and sick. Let's look at the first piece here. In uh, the end of verse 13, it says, the Lord for the body. And I think this is, this is so important. The Lord for the body. I, I just want us to really kind of begin to appreciate that Jesus died for it. He died for you and for me. Holy body, mind, and spirit. He died for it. We just read that the Holy Spirit now lives in it, our bodies. We know from other passages of Scripture that our bodies are connected to Christ himself, the church. You and I are connected to one another as brothers and sisters. We're connected to Christ in that way. And ultimately, that one day, God is going to resurrect us in new bodies. And what I want to suggest to you is to understand that our bodies are very important to God. They matter to God. And matter of fact, it's probably, and I would suggest to you, it is the primary offering that we give to God ourselves before anything else. He's given it to us as a gift and says, offer it back to me as worship. And though I believe that a wonderful aspect of, of our worship, which is just a small piece, I'm going to say, is us coming and singing some songs because the Bible says God inhabits the praise of his people. But God's looking for worshipers, not just 90 minutes a week, but that you and I would offer ourselves all day long. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And I believe we're going to pull out four things here from this text that's going to show us that. The Lord for the body. And ultimately, that all of life is supposed to be worshiping God. Let me just suggest as well as the fact that as we're thinking, if the Lord is for the body, 
that our bodies were never designed to house bitterness, hatred, unforgiveness. That matter of fact, what I would suggest to us today is that those things actually hurt us. See, when you and I are harboring hatred and violence and unforgiveness, we're, we're renting space in our heads, which means that we're not sleeping well, we're fussing, and I, what ends up happening is that our blood pressure goes up, we're getting our arteries are clogging, you know. I mean, the, the, our necks are throbbing. And, and, and I'm not a medical person, so forgive me for my medical people. I heard that those things are bad for you physically. Matter of, and, and we're giving medication out in droves. And there isn't enough medication in the world. And maybe, just maybe, we're housing all this baggage and our bodies were never designed. God actually gives you and me a way to be able to release that. And that is our act of worship. Kindness, mercy, long-suffering, patience, love. That the fruit of God would flow from our lives. But when we begin to house these things in our life, it's literally killing us physically. And I, I believe any research, any medical doctor, any will tell you that these things are literally hurting us physically. So don't believe that your spiritual life doesn't have a direct impact on your physical health. And your physical health has a huge impact on you emotionally and mentally, which then has a huge impact on your spiritual life. They're all connected. And it's, it's not a coinky dink, as, like we, as we like to say in Brooklyn. <laughs> that means co coincidence from my non-Brooklynites, right? That God molded us and shaped us that way and made it a part of worship. You and I were not designed that way. And ultimately, that what you and I were designed for was to surrender those things on the cross, our hurt, our bitterness, our pain, our disappointments, our violations. And pick up God's hope and God's dream and God's agenda for our life, which is of greater joy than what we could possibly make on our own. Verse 13. Paul begins to talk about stomach for food. Stomach for food. And we, we read later, we read in previous. Uh, the previous passage of Scripture before, that in everything that we do, we do it for the glory of God. In other words, that everything that you and I do, think about this. How are we worshiping God? How are we off? What do we have to offer? We're offering the fact that everything we do, from the way that we think, the way that we speak, the way that we handle and respond to others who just dig us to no end, Right? We're not going to harbor these things. Our bodies were not designed. But all these things, whatever we do, whether we eat or drink, that we do it. And this expresses God's character, God's beauty, God's love to the world. I believe it really does. It's just a beautiful act of worship. Let me just say right now, and just as an illustration, hello, my name is Eddie De Jesus, and I'm an alcoholic. Now, I, I haven't had a drink in 18 years. And I believe God has healed me because I believe in healing. I believe in the power of God. But I'm going to tell you something. That in those days, as I was sitting in the pew right there, my master was the alcohol, not my God. And because of that, it almost ruined my career in law enforcement. It nearly ruined my marriage with my wife. And it just, in the early years, I had no relationship with my kids. Because I was not using my body in a way that honored him. And I didn't really know that at the time. And as I began to go, I realized I, 
I cannot be mastered. Paul said, I will not be mastered by anything. Now, I'm not saying that having a drink is bad. The Bible says it's okay. But when it becomes, it masters you. When you can't wake up the day without having a little whatever to get you on your day, then you're mastered by something else. Now, for some of us, that might be an issue. For others, which is, I got all these issues, man, I'm sorry. But you know, for some of us, it's eating. We're eating more than what we can and more than what we should. And I got rolls in places that I never thought I'd have rolls in. And many times when I go to eat, it's because I'm looking for comfort. I go to the fridge. I'm not even hungry. But I'm sad. I'm hurt. I, you know, somebody sent me an email or the letter, and I'm wounded, and what, you know. And, and I go run to the I go refrigerator for the ice cream. And I got like two things of ice cream right now in the refrigerator. <laughs> I'm such a sinner. I just, and, and I struggle, and I struggle. I'm always struggling. I've been struggling with my weight for 20 years. You know, and I lose some weight, and I gain some weight, and I lose some weight, and I gain some weight. I tell you, man, I'm okay, you know. God's, gonna, God's giving me victory, you know what I mean? But it comes in small doses, you know. Praise the Lord, it's all right. But for some, it, this is killing us. The alcohol was killing my liver and my relationship. My overeating, okay, my cholesterol is high, and my blood pressure, and I'm always trying to keep my blood pressure down and my cholesterol down. I'm, you don't think that this has a great impact? It sure does. And the way that we eat and the way that we drink, do we do it in the, for the glory of God? I'm telling you, it has a powerful, powerful witness for us in the Lord. And I would like to challenge us that many times when Paul brings out this issue, the issue is what will you and I live our life for? Will we live it for people's approval? And if we're living for people's approval, we'll, our bodies will be housed with bitterness and hatred and violence. And it wasn't designed that way. If we're living our life because of we want comfort and we're living for self, we'll constantly overeat. We'll constantly then put things in our bodies that were never meant to be in our bodies. And it's not only food, it's not only alcohol, it's drugs. Some of us are so addicted to the medications. And we're just talking real here in our culture. We live in a culture. The American culture in our generation is the most medicated generation in human history. We have a pill for everything. And some of us are now so dependent on these pills and I'm not saying pills are bad. Listen to me. I'm not saying pills are bad. I'm not saying medication is bad. I'm saying if it's mastering you, that's where it's become bad. When it's mastered us. And now, and because we're sick, and I'm telling you, this, the, the, all this stuff makes us sick. All this stuff hurts us. All these things rob us. This is what I know. When my body is aching, whether emotionally, mentally, physically, I don't want to pick up the phone. I love you guys, but right when you're sick, when you're hacking up a lung, you know, when you wake up and you're just not feeling, you don't want to talk to nobody. You know that something, something needs to be done and you're like, oh, I just don't got the strength to do it. And many of us, we miss out. I'm being available for God to do something phenomenal in our lives. Now, we, there's a natural aspect of us getting sick. I'm talking about the self-inflicted kind, not the natural aspect of getting sick. Not the natural, you know, your little grandbaby comes and goes, Ugh. and you go, oh, darn. And then you're sick for a week, right? Or your kids, you send them to school, it's a little Petri dish of uh, bacteria as they, uh, they lick everything, and they come home and... <laughs> And then they spread it all over your house, and you get to get, you know, normal life sickness, right? I'm talking about the self-inflicted kind. And when we do that, we miss out on so much. So whether it's a mental, emotional, whether it's our physical bodies and what we eat or drink, let me just say that probably one of the biggest killers, and, and this is one that my mother struggles with so much, 
<clears throat> is, is smoking. All the research, I'm not a doctor, I'm just telling you what I read. The research tells that every time you smoke a cigarette, you've knocked out probably a minute or two from your life. That time is so precious over the course of decades. With being with your family, being there with your grandkids, being available. And I'm, and I'm just saying, listen, we're just talking real and being here. What are the issues in our life that we're struggling with? And I think that the best place that I learned in the early days with my alcoholism is first to say there's a problem. Because if you don't say there's a problem, then you can never address it and you continue living in bondage. And my heart for you is not to shame or condemn anybody. I'm not shame or condemning. I'm guilty. I stand here guilty. But I stand here saying, listen, I love you too much for you to stay in that condition, I, I, I want to tell you. And I want you to be able to see that there's victory and power in God and overcome. Jump down with me, verse 17. It says, But he who unites himself with the Lord is one with him in spirit. And so we, we, talked, about our, we talked about mentally and emotionally, Lord, the Lord for the body. We talked about our bodies, physical food, and all the things that we eat. And here Paul brings out, I think, this, this issue I'm going to call the marriage bed, the marriage bed. And um, our sexuality. If you look at our generation, we are sex crazy. I mean, God, you can't even watch a commercial on TV with somebody half naked. If, not even half, they're like three quarters of a percent. I mean, it's just... It's crazy. Our kids everywhere, magazines, TVs, we are a sex. You, you can't sell toothpaste without having some sexual connotation to it. I mean, it, it it's, it's, it's gone beyond. And what's happened is we've raised up a generation, my generation and younger, who just, well, hey, you know, let's just explore and have yourself. And You know what the Bible calls that? The Bible has a biblical term or a legal term. It's called fornication, sex outside of marriage. And we're hurting ourselves and our children are hurting us. And I tell you, this thing, I didn't even realize how influential it is in our culture is that when my son started to go to college, wow. And then they started coming back and going, Dad, you know, they meet girls, you know what I mean, that they like, and they don't, they don't want to date first. They want to have sex first. I'm going, whoa, what has happened? The world has turned upside down. And there isn't anything more devastating in your life and in my life is when you have your spouse your loved one going through and experiencing adultery. I tell you, there isn't anything that's going to be more painful that wrecks more people and more families and more marriages in America than ever before. And if you think that your body doesn't have an impact in the world around you, you really need to be able to see you're influencing tons of people. And let me just, let, let's go a little deep with that. Let's just consider this a little deeper than that. Many of us are selling ourselves. You, let me just say that, that, that sex is not bad. And the Bible describes it as a good thing. Okay? In the context of marriage, it's a good thing. It's a wonderful thing, it's an extraordinary thing. And maybe, just maybe, we're selling ourselves cheaply for a cheap thrill instead of the greater joy and how God designed you and me. And many times that can be physical. This is what the research tells us, okay? The research tells us there is an epidemic going on in America right now. And you know what that is? Pornography. We have 
a nation. Scriptures, is, not scripture. The research is saying that over 60% of men are struggling in our culture with pornography. And that is having a devastating impact on relationships. It's having a devastating impact all over because we know what ultimately that it then goes into this ugly word that we, we, we are afraid to say in church and we're afraid to talk about any of these things is that it goes from pornography to masturbation. I know many of you are pushing back going, why did I come to church today? I'm so... <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I just hope you hear my heart, man. My heart for us is, and for you and for my family is that we would not be mastered by anything. That maybe we're settling for a cheap thrill instead of the greater joy. And my heart is that you would see that your life is better. You have something more greater. God loves you. God, God has a wonderful plan and a purpose and a destiny, and he's provided for you and me a way out. And that way out, say, listen, you don't have to settle for a trifle, for a cheap thrill. I offer you the greatest joy and the greatest pleasure and the greatest destiny that you could possibly have. And I did it for you on the cross. I paid the price. I stand here a mess, but I stand in victory in my God. I stand here in the power of him who's able to say, to tell you, listen, God has given me such a freedom. I can share this with you because you know what? If you're offended for me, I'm sorry. If my mannerism has offended you, I am so sorry. That is not my intent. My intent is that you would be free and that you would live an abundant life. The Bible calls this, calls this living holy unto God. And living holy unto God begins with us offering him worship and offering him our bodies. And our bodies in a way as a living sacrifice. And you are too precious to live your life for trifles. You're too precious and loved by a king to give your life away for something so meaningful less that it would never satisfy you. Let me close with this last one here. It says, therefore, honor God with your bodies. And um, over these last few years, this has probably been the, probably the most painful for me <clears throat> in these recent years. And I would say, because it says, whatever you do in life, Whatever you do, do it for the glory of God, right? That our bodies are temple of the Holy Spirit. That even, even in death, we are to honor God with our bodies. The way you and I will check out in this life, we will do either in honor of God or not. My singular prayer has been, Lord, I want to finish this life well. And the sad thing that I have had good friends. Hmm, real good friends that have not finished well. And they've ended their life. They've even taken their life. They have not finished well. And it breaks my heart. And I know when I look at our families, uh, my wife, my, my sons, and all those, I want them to finish well. And the way we go, I've been in rooms, in hospital rooms, where somebody has finished their life well, and there's a whole bunch of us, and we're singing worship songs. I'm telling you, it's the glory of God in the midst of that room in such a way. I can't explain it in words. I wish I had the words to explain it, but it is just, it's magnificent. And this person has gone to glory, and they have finished well. And they've given their final devotion of worship to God, and they've offered their life and said, we have finished well, and we have left a legacy to follow. I, my heart for every new hoper is that you and I would finish this life well. 
not with bitterness, not with hatred, not with anger, not being mastered by food or alcohol or drugs. Not that we would be mastered, you know, by our sexuality or anything other. There's nothing in this life that is more sacred than you and I offering ourselves to him in worship. Because that's how valuable you are. And as your friend, and as your pastor, my heart for you is that you and I would finish well together. And that we would offer God a praise that would shake the foundations of this city and go, what in the world are those people? What do they have? Why do they live so differently? Why do they have so much ability to overcome the pain, the sorrow, the sickness in this life that would normally beat someone down into the ground and we're rising with our heads up high and we're not leaving here in shame or guilt but in great victory for God. And there are just some simple things. What, is, what does it look for us to honor God, to live healthy? And I'm not just talking physically, though I believe that's a big part of it. The first thing I would say is that you and I need to trust God. We need to trust God. That this, is, this is an aspect of being, living healthy, trusting God. And for some of us who have not made that decision to trust God, to follow Jesus, to walk this spiritual life, to, to lay our burdens before him, I'm not saying you're going to know it all. I'm not going to say you're going to figure it all out, but say, listen, you know what? I'm living this life, and there's something different. I, I, I'm living my life for trifles. Maybe I need to live for something greater. And you're starting to take that step. And if you have it, I'm saying, listen, trust your life in Jesus. He paid for it on the cross. He's demonstrated. He's already won the victory on your behalf and my behalf. You don't have to add to it. He's already done it. All you got to do is trust your life in him. And not try to self-medicate or not try to find joy and comfort in anything else in this life that was never meant to give you that comfort. Never. And for those of us who have already made that decision, and like myself, there's certain areas that I have great victory in, and then there's certain areas that I don't. My God still loves me, and I'm working at it. And he's given me the power and high, and this is why we need, you and I need to trust God with our lives. Because that's to where we get power to overcome our hurts, our habits, and our addictions. And this is what I know from my own personal hang-ups and my own personal hurts, that the first step in living healthy is confession. Confession. Because if you and I are not confessing, and confess to God. I mean, I'm not telling you to go out there and whatever. I mean, if God gives you the grace to stand before 100 plus people and, and lay out your dirty laundry, praise the Lord. And if not, praise the Lord. But give it to him. Give it to him for his glory in all things. But this is where I know where help begins. When you and I say, we, I have a problem. I need help. I'm not my own savior. I don't have the power. I need the Holy Spirit to give me power for victory. I'm trusting him for it. There's no shame. There's no guilt. The Bible says there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. None. Zero. Don't leave here with your heads down. Leave here with your heads up with a great victory that God has won for us on the cross. And I'm gonna, my last thing, and as we're, how we walk healthy, I believe is just so powerful, is that you and I live radically generous. We're generously giving our lives. This is what I know. That when you and I are trusting God and we've laid our burdens, at the, our offering at the cross, our pain, our sorrow, our hurts, our rebellion, our disobedience, when we're laying that at the cross, he shows us mercy and grace and forgiveness and then he gives us power to continue to live this thing out. And when you and I experience that, we go, you know what? There is nothing in this life, not my house, not my car, not my 401K, not my pension, not people liking me. None of those things will give me the joy to my Father in heaven loving me. And when that happens, I realize this, the things in this life are temporary. And I just radically give them away. Because I know when I stand before my Father, the rewards in heaven are not going to be from what I received in this life, my rewards in heaven will be from what I've given. 
And radical generosity flows out of a believer's life when they understand that this life can never, ever possibly fully satisfy us and give us what we need. And so we just give it away for a greater joy. We actually deny ourselves, and that's why we fast, so that we'll have more to share. That's, that's why we consider living on less, so we can have a more impact for others. And, and, and you say, well, that, it makes perfect sense. If you're a parent, you live with less, so your children can have more. That, would, that takes no effort. And my heart is that we would do that. Let's all stand. Right now, I just want us to, some of us are in places like I was many years ago, and there are many areas right now, and I say, okay, Lord, you need power from on high. And I'm just going to pray that God, right now, where you're standing, because you and I are standing as a body of believers in the presence of God, and that he would give you and, po- you and me power and ability to overcome these areas and take this step forward because you're that valuable to him. Father, I thank you, Lord, for every single person here. You know our hearts. You know what we're struggling with, Lord. Father, whether, Lord, it's, it's anger or bitterness or hatred or depression. Father, whether, Lord, it's, it's our love for comfort and food and, and stuff that will make us happy because we can't find in anything else and we're trusting something else in this life than you. Father, whether it's our own personal joy in our sexuality, and that's where we're going to find that people like us and whatever, and we're selling ourselves for trifles. Oh, Lord, even when we're trying to finish well, Lord, we're willing, we, we want to give up. We're, we're just, we've had enough, and I pray, Father, we would trust you more right now. You know where every single person is at. I don't know, but I pray right now, Lord, that the Spirit of God would fall on our hearts, that, our, that the altar of our heart would be prepared to receive your blessing and your healing right now in the name of Jesus. May we come before you, trusting you, confessing to you right now where we're at, and that you would transform us and all of creation, that we would be a radically generous group of people as an expression of our worship and offering to you as we love one another. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful, wonderful day.